Hello, this is Christine Linke, Webcast Manager at Premia, and I am pleased to welcome you to this Premia webinar. Today, her Sheffrin will present Risk Management and the Financial Crisis, a Behavioral Perspective. Her Sheffrin is the Mario L. Bellati Professor of Finance at Santa Clara University, and he also teaches in the Master of Science in Risk Management program at New York University Stern School of Business. Please feel free to submit your questions to the presenter via the question pane on the right-hand side of your screen at any time during the presentation. Questions will be answered at the end of the session as time allows. Following this webinar, a link to the presentation will be emailed to you along with a link to the recording of today's webinar. And so with that, I will turn it over to you, Hirsch. Thank you so much, Christine, and hello, everyone. So. We're going to be having, I think, a very interesting discussion today, and I very much look forward to your questions about really the behavioral root of, uh, of the global financial crisis. I did want to <clears throat> just thank NYU for uh, sponsoring uh, today's program and to mention that they have this uh, incredibly interesting MS program in, um, in risk management for uh, uh, for uh, from a boardroom perspective, uh, it has a schedule, as you'll uh, note on your screen, that is uh, part time. It's a it's a modular schedule. Classes are held uh, in New York and also uh, in Amsterdam, uh, together with uh, NYU's partner, the Amsterdam Institute of Finance. Uh, it's got a terrific network. NYU Stern alumni is a community of uh, over ninety thousand, and. Um, the faculty is uh, is uh, just uh, excellent. I'm really proud to be part of that faculty, and uh, I've been involved with uh, with the program since its inception. I'm going to draw my comments today in terms of content from uh, several sources, but in terms of my own work, I just wanted to mention two pieces. One is uh, my book, Ending the Management Illusion. Uh, I've talked about that book on on prior webinars, and uh, the second is behavioral. Uh, corporate finance. So, ending the management illusion is uh, really written for professional uh, readers, and behavioral corporate finance is uh, more of a textbook. But the two of them together pretty much uh, comprise uh, my global thinking about about the importance of uh, behavioral corporate finance uh, for risk management. Let me give you a, a sense of what the plan is for the discussion today two major components. And the first component, I want to talk about what I like to call the, the low-hanging behavioral fruit. I think that th these are the kind of issues that, as a behavioral economist, it's pretty apparent what the behavioral psychological issues were that uh, led us to where we are today in terms of the, the generation of the crisis. Uh, and then I want to move on in, in the second component and talk about what I think are the, the deeper behavioral issues that are much more, more subtle, um, less easy to spot, um, but uh, just as important if even um, uh, not more important. And so I'll be hitting four key points. I want to talk about the role of agency cost. Uh, I want to talk about the character of regulation. I want to talk about the connection between finance and politics. And then I want to talk about uh, the work of, uh, of Hyman Minsky. So I'd like to actually begin with a, with a polling question to get a sense of, of uh, uh, your own thinking as we head into this discussion. So the question that's posed, and I'll just read it aloud, is the primary cause of the financial crisis was and then you have uh, a choice of five options, A, B, C, D, and E. So A is government policy that encouraged home ownership. B, deregulation occurring in the last 15 years. C, Federal Reserve policy between 2001 and 2004. D, psychologically driven errors in the financial sector. And E is other. So, and Christine, could you go ahead and launch that question for the audience? Absolutely. I'm going to launch that now, and the audience has about 10 seconds to respond. <laughs> 
Okay, everyone, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and announce the results. And Hirsch, for your benefit, since the screen will be difficult for you to see, I'll let you know that 20% of the audience selected A, 39% selected B, 6% selected C, 24% selected D, and 11% selected E. Wonderful. Thank you so much. <clears throat> All right. So the, the plurality view is that deregulation was the, uh, was the most important. Thank you ever so much for, for that feedback. All right, so on to the first major component, the low-hanging fruit. So if you take a look in front of you, I think that you'll see some familiar images from, uh, from the crisis itself. Uh, you can peruse that. I'm sure it will just remind you what the key issues were. And those issues have to do with what we should remind ourselves were the, the fundamental supply chain associated with, with the financial sector. So it begins with the origination of uh, homeowner mortgages, which were sold, securitized, and sliced into, uh, into CDOs. It ends with them being held by end investors, many of whom were actually uh, investment banks and commercial banks. And in between, we have the role of the ratings agencies that uh, overrated um, the quality of, uh, of uh, mortgage-backed securities and CDOs, and uh, we have this incredibly important component that the credit default swaps provided insurance for, uh, for default risk on mortgages, particularly subprime mortgages. At the heart of this first component are the psychological errors that I suggest were committed at, right across the entire spectrum of the uh, financial uh, product supply chain. So I'm going to pick out some particular firms to talk about, Merrill Lynch, UBS, Citigroup, AIG, S&P, and as an end investor, uh, I'm going to pick the local council of Narvik, Norway. As we head into this section, let me identify three particular psychological pitfalls that I think played a pronounced role in the evolution of the financial crisis. So the first is hot hand fallacy. Hot hand fallacy, um, as a term comes from uh, a basketball where the tendency is that basketball fans when they're watching a game and a particular player looks like they can't miss as they are attempting to shoot every time they shoot it's like a basket. Um, it's the belief that players get hot during games and so that if, you, if you're hot during a game you have a hot hand. And what that means is that if you have a hot hand the probability that you'll sink your next shot is higher than it is otherwise. Sometimes you're cold, sometimes you're hot. If you're hot, you're hot. Uh, that turns out to be a fallacy because when we look at the data, basketball players, um, the probability of making their next shot is pretty much the same from game to game. Some players have higher accuracy rates than others, but for a given player, there's very little variation in success probability from game to game. It's counterintuitive. Fans don't believe it. Coaches don't believe it. You really have to look at the data, and this is a case in point where our statistics, our statistical intuition can fail us. Risk-seeking in the domain of losses, the second uh, psychological pitfall, is the tendency that once we are in trouble, once we perceive ourselves to be in the domain of losses, our propensity to take risk soars. This, I would suggest, is a major issue for risk management. And then finally, overconfidence. Overconfidence is the tendency to believe that we are more able than we are, that we have more ability than we have, and that we know more than we do. That's not to say that overconfident people aren't smart or intelligent. You can have very, very bright people who are smart and intelligent, but overconfidence just means they think they're smarter <laughs> than they actually are or know more than they actually do. So the next slide um, is Bob Schiller's uh, portrayal of what happened to home prices uh, in the United States uh, between uh, the late 1800s and uh, you know up till now. And the most this is all in real terms, so inflation adjusted. And if you look at this graph, you'll see there are ups and downs in in home prices. They don't seem to be particularly driven by population or by building costs. 
and uh, but there is a sort of a, a trend through the data that's absent until you get to uh, the beginning of this past decade. And then you can see this bubble at the end, and it looks very much like the dot-com bubble that we saw. So it rose and it burst, and then down we drop. And I just you know, do want to emphasize before I go on to the next slide that if you see where the series is now, we're sort of back into territory that would seem quite natural had the bubble not burst. And so the U.S. housing market is, I would say, uh, not especially healthy. There were a few signs of a little bit of growth this morning, for example, but nothing like what's normal. And so for those who think that you're going to, that being healthy means housing prices going up again to what they were prior to the uh, collapse of the bubble, well, that would be very unhealthy. We're sort of back into normal territory now. And I think in terms of growth, that's unlikely to be a good sign as we sort of work out through foreclosures and deleveraging the mess that we have found ourselves in. But to go back to history, so between 1997-2006, uh, that's when you really had uh, the bubble expanding before it burst. And home prices rose at uh, five times their historical rate. And I would suggest this is an example of hot hand fallacy in that the key players pretty much thought that housing prices would continue to increase. Some were stronger in this belief than others, but I think that throughout the financial sector, the view that housing prices were in a bubble, a national bubble, not just a local bubble, but a national bubble, I think it was the minority view. Let's talk about some of the players. So Merrill Lynch, I think, pretty much became the preeminent um, player when it came to mortgage-backed securities, CDOs, and so on. So in October 2008, about $260 billion of, uh, of asset-backed CDOs in their portfolio went into default. And if you ask, well, how did this happen historically? If you go back a few years to uh, July 2004, rewind that tape, what you'll find is that in 2004, their performance wasn't too well, wasn't going, wasn't too, too good. And in particular, it was well below competitor Lehman Brothers. It was well below competitor Goldman Sachs. Stanley O'Neill was the CEO. And he was just felt that psychologically, Merrill Lynch may have perceived itself to be in the domain of losses. And so Merrill focused on Lehman's ability to profit from mortgage-based products and decided to go into that business. There's a wonderful description of what happened at Merrill in uh, a book by Bethany McLean and Joan Sarah called All the Devils Are Here, which came out last year. And it, it identifies um, in a very nice journalistic way what happened specifically with key people. So Stanley O'Neill the, was the CEO. You see him on the right. Osman Smerchi uh, ran the mortgage desk, and uh, Amis Fakahani on the, on the left uh, basically ran risk management towards the end. And it's very interesting. You know, Lehman Brothers, where vision gets built, that was their tagline. It seems kind of ironic now, but it played a key role for the, for the decision makers at at Merrill. So I want to suggest um, that psychologically the key decision makers at Merrill, notably Stanley O'Neill, the CEO, succumbed to risk seeking in the domain of losses. It led him to put together a strategy where Merrill would acquire about a dozen residential and commercial mortgage related companies and assets. And it would be in the entire business from origination all the way through to selling CDOs to investors. They, just that huge um, uh, uh, swatch of the, of, the, of the financial product supply chain. UBS, OK, so now we're going to change characters. The thing I like about UBS is that they put together a shareholder report that laid out an internal view of what went wrong in their organization. And it came out in April 2008, so before the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy. 
but it outlined the weaknesses in their processes. So what you see the two bullet points on this particular screen are, are excerpts um, that from their report. And so they tell us they used an external consultant and the consultant examined their performance and this is similar to Merrill. So they're looking at their relative performance, their performance relative to competitors, and they see a gap between their own performance and the performance of who they call the composite leader. And this consultant recommended that UBS selectively invest in developing certain areas of its business to close key product gaps, including mortgage-backed security subprime, adjustable rate mortgages, and so on. So this next screen is a little bit more current. UBS blames $2 billion loss on Rogue Trader. And as you know, the CEO wound up resigning along with others. And there's a lesson here that I, I, I want to emphasize as a, really as a sidebar. And, and the lesson is, is this. So one of the key themes of my book, Ending the Management Illusion, is that when it comes to risk management, you have to think about risk management culture. Risk management culture is embodied in a framework that I call a pitfalls process framework. You look at the manner in which psychological pitfalls reside within organizational processes. And in that framework, the persistence of pitfalls within processes, you need to be activist in the way you remove the pitfalls from the processes. It's not easy. So when you see an organization whose culture is weak, that weakness, if it's difficult to address, winds up manifesting itself down the line in other process-related problems. And so although I, I wouldn't predict, I wouldn't have predicted that UBS would wound up would wind up with a rogue trader problem, major rogue trader problem. Uh, per se, but I would say that the likelihood is that if you've got a weaknesses in your culture, this sort of issue is more likely to arise. So in, in, in my w webinar from last spring, for those of you who, who, were, who were tuned in for that, I mentioned that you know, in Ending the Management Illusion, I pointed out that BP had a very weak culture um, back when I wrote Ending the Management Illusion, so this was 2008, and therefore it makes it much more likely that you'll have a disaster down the line, as happened with, um, with the uh, explosion of Deepwater Horizon in the Gulf of Mexico in the summer of uh, 2010. And so the same point goes here, that you're simply more vulnerable if your, weak management, if your risk management culture is weak. Now, aversion to a sure loss or risk seeking in the domain of losses, uh, those are two uh, 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 similar names for the same phenomena. That was really important, as was overconfidence at UBS. Subprime for UBS, subprime was specifically identified as providing significant revenue growth opportunities. And here's the interesting thing from the UBS report itself. The consultant's review did not consider risk capacity, for example, stress risk, market risk, in connection with the the product expansion that they were recommending. And you have to ask why they didn't raise the issue. It's so vital. And why it is that UBS didn't think that was such an important issue. They just went with it. And I suggest that, you know, overconfidence is uh, has as its one of its phenomena um, the tendency to undervalue risk or to underestimate risk. And these two can go together. So if you don't value risk because you're in risk-seeking mode, then you will tend not to give it much attention and that can lead you to act as if you're overconfident. Okay, next, next actor, Citigroup. So late 2004, early 2005, uh, Robert Rubin, former uh, Secretary of the Treasury in the Clinton administration, 
Now he's back at, at uh, Citigroup and he is uh, uh, on the board and he's deeply involved in the decision by Citigroup to uh, increase its risk exposure. Why? Because Citigroup's profit growth is anemic. It's flagging and they're thinking about what they can do. So now I want to suggest Merrill Lynch looking to boost profits because its, below, its, its position lies below the industry leader. UBS, same issue as Merrill Lynch. Citigroup, same issue as Merrill Lynch and UBS. Colleagues on the board deferred to Robert Rubin because he was on that board the only one with experience as a trader or a risk manager. And he himself is quoted as saying in response to this issue during an interview with a journalist, yeah, I knew what a CDO was, you know, suggesting that the other members of the board did not. So the title of this slide you see is Risk Seeking in the Domain of Losses. And I want to suggest the same psychological phenomenon manifested itself here as at Merrill Lynch and at UBS. Rubin told the press that his decision to increase risk at UBS followed a presentation to the board by a consultant. So we've got the same kind of dynamic taking place at Citigroup as at UBS. And what's the bottom line? The bottom line was that the bank historically was committing less of its capital on capital on its balance sheet on a risk-adjusted basis than competitors. So what they decided to do was to commit more of that capital uh, towards, towards risk. And Rubin said, you know, it gave room to do more, assuming you're doing intelligent risk reward decisions. And when I look at that, assuming you're doing intelligent risk reward decisions, all of these jokes about economists making assumptions comes to mind, I think, except that this one is, you know, stranger than fiction. AIG. So I think that if AIG hadn't been in the credit default swap business when it came to subprime loans, that might have prevented, um, served as enough of an obstacle so that this um, bandwagon might not have gotten rolling. But in any way, they, they did. They lost more than $100 billion from their exposure to, uh, to uh, uh, selling CDS protection on mortgage defaults. And you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, McLean and Nocera in uh, All the Devils Are Here, they, they give us a lot of insight uh, into what the thought process at AIG was. And so AIG was um, basically insuring through uh, credit default swaps, was insuring pools of mortgages. And then the question is, what fraction of those pools were subprime? So, McLean and Nocera report that if um, that some of the uh, uh, folks who worked at AIG and were concerned about overexposure did a survey in the firm and asked people, and most of the key personnel who were making the decisions thought that the composition of those pools contained about 10% subprime when in reality it was 85%. And so this is like an insurance company selling automobile insurance to teenage drivers, but charging premiums that would apply to those in there who were ages 40 and 50. And I think that's really what you had happen here. And so the you know talk about opaqueness and the absence of incentives for for exactly monitoring what was going on. That seems to be a key issue at AIG. Joe Cassano, Joseph Cassano, headed up uh, AIG and in 2007. He's quoted as saying, it's hard for us without being flippant to even see a scenario within any kind of realm of reason that would see us losing one dollar. So in retrospect, that's pretty striking and it suggests very strong overconfidence on on his part. Standard & Poor's rating agency. So S&P uh, was a division, is a division of, uh, of uh, McGraw-Hill, uh, the large conglomerate. 
And McGraw-Hill was not doing well in its other divisions. And they put pressure on um, S&P to expand uh, back in the uh, early part of the decade. The ratings business was generating a third of the organization's revenue, so they were a key player. So I think what you had happen was you had risk-seeking in the domain of losses rear its ugly head, attempting to, if, and I should say, these are psychological losses, not, not losing money in, in the sense of having your earnings be negative but simply that you feel that you are below aspiration level, psychological loss as opposed to financial loss. And so the pressure is on to take on risk. So Richard Gugliotta oversaw CDOs in the late 1990s all the way through 2005. He was interview interviewed by Bloomberg. And what he said was that you know, competition with Moody's amounted to a market share war where criteria were relaxed. So these guys basically wound up in a race to the bottom in, a, in an attempt to, to boost their profits. Gail Scott was a, a commercial mortgage analyst, and uh, she wrote a memo in 2004 as S&P was trying to boost its profits through uh, rating of CDOs. And this was from her memo, this quote, we are meeting with your group this week to discuss adjusting criteria for rating CDOs of real estate assets because of the ongoing threat of losing deals. So this is about a memo that says, look, we have to adjust, meaning lower, our standards and criteria for rating CDOs because we want to increase our revenues. Last example from the supply chain. So the local council of Narvik, Norway. Narvik, uh, just a community just north of the Arctic Circle, population 17,000, found that it was losing population as its young people thought there were limited opportunities north of the Arctic Circle were leaving. Therefore, the tax base was dropping. So I suggest like Merrill Lynch, UBS, Citigroup, AIG, that you had this tendency to increase your risk, risk exposure being in the domain of psychological losses. Narvik owned a hydroelectric dam that generated a stream of cash flows. They just felt the stream of cash flows wasn't enough. So they, they did a leveraged strategy. They borrowed against the cash flows of the hydroelectric dam, so though it was collateralized. And they went into CDOs. $200 million in CDOs. They didn't understand. The only thing they knew about those CDOs was that the rating agency said they're AAA. And in the end, they wound up losing $35 million, about a quarter of their annual budget, which stressed them mightily. So I think the low-hanging behavioral fruit, the most important of those three psychological concepts is risk-seeking in the domain of losses. And those losses are psychological losses, not necessarily financial losses. Overconfidence, however, I think was played a key role. And certainly, hot hand fallacy drove the uh, housing bubble itself. Now I want to turn attention to uh, the second component, which, which I think are the, the deeper psychological issues. And, and these involve the, the connection between overconfidence and, and agency cost. So just to remind you that agency cost has to do with the cost of interactions between principals and agents that results uh, from a conflict of interest between those two parties. And I want to mention two potential mistakes about agency cost. The first is that we have a tendency to confuse agency cost and behavioral cost, especially um, in academic finance. So we see that there's a, a problem, and anytime there's a problem in, in academic finance, our first thought is, well, it's got to be a conflict of interest. But it's important to distinguish between a conflict of interest and a psychological error. Because if you're going to treat the, the issue, if you're going to address the issue, the remedy for for agency conflicts is different from the agent, the remedy for, for behavioral 
um, pitfalls. So that's the first mistake, confusion between agency and behavioral. The second mistake is the tendency to be overconfident that the right incentives have been put into place to address conflicts of interest. That's the second mistake. They are both behavioral in nature, but they're different. So let me just mention uh, uh, something about the first mistake. There is a notion called control fraud, introduced by William Black, who is on the faculty at uh, the University of Missouri at Kansas City. And uh, he wrote this really interesting book, The Best Way to Rob a Bank is to Own One. Uh, that's his picture. You see him uh, down below. He had been a bank regulator. He'd been a bank regulator during the SNL crisis. Uh, he fought tooth and nail because he saw from the inside what was happening within the SNL industry in terms especially of fraud committed by CEOs of some major SNLs. Uh, you may remember that there were, was a group called the Keating Five, uh, Charles Keating, one, one of the uh, prominent uh, owners of an SNL, uh, had um, used lobbying influence to pull together a group of senators to help to influence the regulators to pull back uh, and stop being so hard on, on SNLs. And uh, in that respect, uh, Charles Keating had written in a margin, get black as an instruction to his uh, uh, lieutenants to uh, try and neutralize Black, who was fighting very hard to uh, have a stronger regulation in terms of actions with respect to the SNLs. So now I'm going to uh, ask your um, uh, opinion about a series of other issues as we move into the deeper section. So. Um, I'm going to just uh, read aloud what, what, what the question is and what your options are. So what shocked Alan Greenspan was that, this is post-financial crisis, what shocked Alan Greenspan post-financial crisis was that A, markets were inefficient, B, housing bubble was not a local phenomenon, C, financial executives behaved irrationally, D, homeowners strategically defaulted on their mortgage payments when the value of their homes fell below the principal on their mortgages. And E, don't know. So Christine, if, if you could go ahead and launch that question for the audience. I will be happy to do so. I'm going to launch that now, everyone, and you have about 10 seconds to mark your answers. Okay, I have about 75% of the audience that has voted, so I'm going to close the poll and announce the results. And Hirsch, we had 30% of the audience select A, 15% select B, 34% select C, 12% select D, and 9% selected E. Thank you. So financial executives behaved irrationally is the mode with markets being inefficient a close second. So those two together give us uh, a, a strong majority for uh, irrational behavior and inefficiency, two of the major aspects of behavioral finance, which delights me, I have to say. So let's go and see what Alan Greenspan actually did say. So these are direct quote from his testimony. I found a flaw in the model that I perceived as the critical functioning structure that defines how the world works. This crisis, however, has turned out to be much broader than anything I could have imagined. Those of us who have looked to the self-interest of lending institutions to protect shareholders' equity, myself especially, are in the state of shocked disbelief. So I think there you have it. I think uh, basically he says that uh, the plurality response is, uh, is the most important, but to be sure, inefficient markets play a key role. So in the rest of the talk, I, I want to focus on, on three issues. Um, I want to talk about agency cost and home ownership, and this will harken back to the first polling question that, that we did. I want to talk about the connection among agency costs 
regulators, finance, and politics. And then I want to end up by d having a discussion uh, with you about the, about the work of uh, macroeconomist Hyman Minsky. So home ownership and agency cost. There is a very interesting book by uh, Gretchen Morgensen, whose picture you see uh, before you on the left, and Joshua Rosner, whose picture you see on the right, called Reckless Endangerment. It came out last year. It's about the, the um, uh, global crisis. And it, it goes back um, historically into the 90s to talk about the, the role of Fannie Mae. Um, I think that uh, it's it's very it offers it offers uh, uh, some insights that are particularly striking about the way that politics and finance uh, work together. Uh, in the Clinton administration, Bill Clinton's picture is up on uh, on this slide off to the right because during the Clinton administration, you had a marked ratcheting up of an interest in government promotion of home ownership in the US. And you then had a partnership strengthened between the public sector and the private sector through the government-sponsored entities, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. That's why you see Fannie Mae's uh, um, uh, image off to the left. And in the bottom middle of the screen, you have the um, a photo of James Johnson, who uh, for the uh, much of the 90s and early 2000s was uh, the CEO of, um, of Fannie Mae, and who played a very important role in uh, setting the stage that sort of allowed the housing bubble to emerge. So the main points about about James Johnson uh, as CEO of Fannie Mae was that he really seized the reins of establishing a culture within which the public-private partnership could produce an increase in in home ownership. Uh, the strategy that he used was a combination of finance and political lobbying. So he built congressional support in, in, in very clever ways. He looked to see, for example, where the opposition might come from politically. And then he neutralized that opposition by providing grants, for example, to uh, some of the favored projects of the people who, who complained the most. And one of his top priorities was to safeguard the implicit put option that US taxpayers had conferred on Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. You know, in the end, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, during the financial crisis, wound up being taken into conservatorship. So he was successful in that respect. He was successful in uh, making what was not an explicit put option, something that was believed to be the case, so that most people really believed that all the risk would be borne by the federal government, even though it was not written in stone. Though in the end, politically, that actually had to happen in order to avoid uh, severe problems, the too big to fail issue. Countrywide the largest originator of mortgages in the United States, certainly when it came to subprime. And they, together with Fannie Mae, really drove the engine of the housing bubble. So countrywide, a bank originated, um, originated um, mortgages and then basically sold them to Fannie Mae. They were Fannie Mae's biggest supplier. So this partnership emphasized low quality subprime loans. The partnership resulted in large executive bonuses, both at Countrywide 
and at Fannie Mae. And both of those institutions wound up featuring accounting fraud in major ways. This is Angela Mozilla, the picture that you see in front of you, and he is uh, testifying he was the CEO of, uh, of Countrywide. Part B of the story was the deterioration of mortgage lending standards that took place. This, I imagine, is a very familiar story by now, but I'll just quickly remind you what happened in that 2001 through 2006 period when the housing bubble expansion was underway. So loan to value ratios declined from about 80% from about, um, uh, uh, sorry, loan to value uh, ratios increased from about 80% to 90%. So instead of having the average homeowner putting 20% down to buy a home, they put down 10%. The proportion of loans that were 100% financing went from 3% to over 30%. So many homeowners didn't have to put any money down to buy a house. Most significantly, uh, limited documentation loans meaning that, or liar's loans, where you just had to state your income and no one would look to see if it was accurate or not, uh, increased uh, dramatically uh, um, uh, during that period, and the co as did the combination of loans that were uh, combining 100% financing and limited documentation. So there we have weakening fundamentals, clear as crystal, and I would say clear as crystal in retrospect, it should have been clear as crystal to um, analysts at investment banks like UBS, but they tell us they just didn't bother to look inside to see exactly what the character of those mortgages were at a time when they should have. Here's a story about um, whether alarms got sounded. So I don't want to leave you with the impression impression that nobody knew there was trouble brewing. I don't want to leave you with the impression that regulators didn't know. John Dugan uh, be headed, uh, headed up the, the OCC, the Office of Controller of the Currency, uh, beginning in 2005. And when he took over, one of the first things he did was to sound the alarm about what was happening in the mortgage market. If you read his speeches, you'll see he warned about option ARM lending. He explicitly said that many buyers, particularly buyers who didn't have good credit, they were soon go weren't going to be able to afford their housing payments. And then he added something that for 2005 was uh, prescient, that if housing prices declined, homeowners wouldn't be able to sell their way out of the mess. And back in 2005, when most homeowners thought that trees do grow to the sky uh, when it came to housing prices, uh, that idea just seemed to be uh, completely unrealistic. So economists have a concept called capture theory. And capture theory says that Organizations that are regulated learn how to manipulate those who do the regulating. So there could be, for example, revolving door strategies where you let the regulators know that if they want well-paying jobs in the industry over time, that those regulators, when they become former regulators, will find good work in the industry itself. That kind of gives a, an incentive not to be too hard. You can see it in the way the airline industry works. You could see it in the way that BP was regulated. It's just, it's just part and parcel of the, way of, the, of the way the world works. So faced with ominous signs that the housing market was in jeopardy, uh, what you did have coming out of OCC was an attempt to work with other regulatory agencies to propose new guidelines for banks writing risky loans. So some within the regulatory community you know, tried to raise the flag, but I will tell you that lobbying efforts can be very successful. Bush administration came to be heavily lobbied in order to, to have these uh, regulations proposals thwarted. And it took a year for something to come out 
Uh, so 2006, you know, just about the time that the housing market was peaking on its own, new rules wound up getting released, but the toughest of the proposed provisions were gone by then. Capture theory at, at work. So here's what was proposed that didn't make it into the regulations. Banks that bundle and sell mortgages must disclose to investors what they're buying. Okay. Sensible disclosure. Also gone, banks must verify that buyers actually have jobs and can afford houses. No more liar's loans, in other words. Also gone, banks have to advise home buyers that interest rates might increase and large payments might be due sooner than expected. So these are all sensible provisions that didn't make it through. And the question is why? And it seems to be the case that, well, you know, you have multiple regulators multiple agencies. You've got the OCC, the Office of Control of the Currency, the FDIC, the Federal Reserve, the Office of Thrift, Thrift, Thrift Supervision. They all have different philosophies about how strongly to regulate, and they all had to agree on these provisions. And then, you know, typically they didn't. So what you got was you got the lowest common denominator develop. Ben Bernanke, when he took over as, uh, as Fed chair, I think established a lot of continuity with Alan Greenspan's thinking. And Alan Greenspan and the Fed generally during uh, 2004, 2005, pretty much thought that there may be local bu bubbles in housing market, but you didn't have a national housing bubble underway. Bernanke effectively said that um, uh, during his tenure. Uh, so in retrospect, when, when, when asked what made him upset, the interesting thing is he focused on AIG and said, I don't think there's a single episode in this entire 18 months that has made me more angry, that AIG exploited a huge gap in the regulatory system. There was no oversight of the financial products division. And so for, you know, for him, it was the, the weakness in the regulatory system that was key. And I, I did note, you know, if we sort of look back to, you, to your responses as, as, a, as a group to the, the, the nature of the problem, that many of you did, in fact, think that it was a, um, a, a weak, weak regulation. So let's talk about finance and, and politics. Uh, I have to, I have to um, be honest and, and tell you that um, although I've always thought that politics was, was important for finance, only recently um, am, I, am I learning how to think about that issue analytically. I, I, wrote, a, I wrote a piece for the, for the Premier Journal uh, that came out last year that applied game theory to sort of look at the dynamics associated with uh, debates involving a regulatory change. It's, it's based on uh, a political scientist's work, uh, Bruce Buena the Mosquito, whose picture you see on this screen, and he wrote a book called The Predictioneer's Game that I have to say was you know, incredibly insightful for me. And I used that framework uh, together with my colleague Shabnam Lusavi to, to forecast how Dodd-Frank might emerge as Dodd-Frank was in the process of being d developed. And the model came out to be incredibly close all throughout that process, the prediction was going to be very strongly that although in 2008, 2009, it felt like we were back in the beginnings of uh, the 1930s, that what was going to the regulatory outcome, Dodd-Frank, what came to be called Dodd-Frank, wouldn't, wouldn't wind up being anything as strong as what happened in 1933 and 1934 uh, as far as the as the key legislation that that would provide the underpinnings for the uh, for financial market regulation in the in the U.S. So now we're going to do our last uh, polling question, and this is about Hyman Minsky, the macroeconomist. And so, Hyman Minsky argued that a Keynes's proposals destabilize economies. B the Fed does not follow the Taylor Rule. C, during boom times, the financial sector becomes overly engaged in Ponzi finance. D, the Federal Reserve should be abolished. E, don't know, not familiar with Minsky. So, Christine, if you could go ahead and launch that question for the audience. <laughs> 
Okay, I'm going to do that right now, and everyone, again, will take about 10 seconds to complete this. Okay, I have about 75% of the audience voting, so I'm going to close the poll and announce the results now. And Hirsch, we had 9% of the audience select A, 6% select B, 25% select C, 4% select D, and 56% select E. Thanks. Well, I have to tell you that I thought E would be a very big number. So let me talk about Hyman Minsky because I think that most people just don't know who he is or what he said. So Hyman Minsky was a macroeconomist. He died in 1996. Like the comedian Rodney Dangerfield, I don't think he got enough respect in his lifetime. But when you read his work today and you look at what happened in 2006, 7, 8, 9, it looks prophetic. He argued that capitalism is inherently unstable. And the core issues of his analysis involve the way that the financial sector provides debt financing for new projects over the course of business cycle expansion. The nature of, his, of what he emphasized, he, I, I have to say, he, it's a very comprehensive perspective on the way that economics and finance work. And what he said was that there's a tendency within our system for the financial sector to become increasingly innovative in design in its use of financial products as a, um, as, as, during the expansion phase. Okay? And that during that period of expansion, the financial sector will tend to boost its own leverage, and it will tend to fund projects that, are, that display ever-increasing risk, and most importantly, whose cash flow horizons exceed the maturities of the associated debt. So he's really telling us to be, just think really carefully about what banking and also shadow banking involve. They involve funding projects with long-term cash flows, but, you're, but, but you don't have long maturities to match the long horizons of the projects. Rather, you have short-term debt using, being used excessively to fund projects that have long-term horizons. He distinguished three broad categories of financing. He called them hedge finance, speculative finance, and Ponzi finance. So hedge finance is what happens when you match the maturity of the debt to the horizon of the cash flows. Speculative finance is what happens when you simply mismatch maturity and horizon, so short-term financing to finance longer-term projects. And Ponzi finance is speculative finance, but where you don't expect the cash flows from the project directly to provide the funding to repay the debt. Instead, you count on increased asset values to do the job. So it's not a Ponzi scheme. Ponzi financing isn't a Ponzi scheme. But he used the word Ponzi because he, he wanted that, that type of financing to capture the idea that somehow you didn't have in sustainability in terms of the generation of the cash flow, that you have to count on appreciation to do the job, and that increased the riskiness of that type of financing. He talked about too big to fail. He called our system contingent socialism because when times get tough, we wind up bailing out organizations that are too large to fail. It could be banks. It could be automobile companies. He talked about both. 
He said the financial sector comes to be dominated by a small number of large firms that have become too big to fail, and that regulators are going to wind up being outmatched by financial firms. So inherent in the system, it's simply par for the course. It's just the way the system is that you're going to wind up, even if you put sensible regulations in place, the ability of regulators will be, will be less than the ability of the financial firms who have um, strong incentives and the resources to outmaneuver. As an expansion tails off, he warned us that the relative prices of capital assets, interest rates, default risk, they all go up as the economy expands and it sort of winds up being a big surprise for too many members of the financial sector but that the ensuing dynamic eventually leads to contractionary monetary policy, which in turn induces an economic downturn and a financial crisis. If you look to see what happened to interest rates during 2000, just before the dot-com bubble burst, you will see that the, that the Fed increased interest rates at least six times before that happened. If you look at what brought the housing bubble to an end, 18 increases in interest rates leading up to the housing price peak. The Fed does play an incredibly important role when it comes to bubbles. End game and reset in a Minsky framework. So in responding to a, a crisis, the government uses a combination of fiscal and monetary policy to inject economic stimulus and to rescue financial institutions that are too big to fail. These measures mitigate the magnitude of the downturn, but also set the stage for the next expansion and the subsequent crisis. So this last bullet point. You know, I, I have to say I find it sort of informative, but I also it, I find it so discouraging because my, before reading Minsky carefully, my sense was surely we can figure out ways to prevent financial crises from happening. But Minsky warns that that's just too much to ask. What you really ought to ask is what you can do to mitigate them, to deal with them when they happen so that there isn't too much damage done, but to understand that when you solve one financial crisis, you set in motion the seeds that will lead to the next one. So the takeaway from Minsky is that the, the financial crisis dynamic that developed uh, during this decade, it's, it followed the Minsky script. Remember, he died in 1996, so he didn't see any of this happening in terms of its detail. But in terms of the structure, it's there. Finance occurs in a social context that features politics, regulation, agency cost, and psychological imperfections. And so we have to be careful about over-focusing just on one aspect even just the psychological imperfections, there is a big picture. And I think that was one of his key points. So beware narrow framing is a message that says, don't get over-focused on just part of the problem. There is a big interconnected story to get our arms around. So the conclusion for, our, uh, for this particular webinar, so three points to take away and remember. One is recognize psychology was absolutely key in terms of driving the financial decisions that, that lay at the heart of the crisis. Two, learn the lesson Alan Greenspan learned too late. Be skeptical about trusting incentives to make certain that nothing bad will happen, that risk will be properly managed. Incentives aren't enough. And finally, three, remember what Minsky told us, look for the big picture in which finance, politics, and the macroeconomy macro interact with each other. So with that, I will uh, stop at this point and very much look forward to your questions. Back to you, Christine. Okay, Hirsch, we did get several questions in, um, so if you can refer to your question. Uh, if you have any trouble with that, please let me know. Okay, just give me a second here. Sure. 
All right. So I'm just going to go ahead and make this So let me just get myself organized here. Uh, okay, so we have a question from Eric Coker, who says, when you speak about being vulnerable because of a weak culture, can you elaborate on what defines a weak culture? And yes, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to think in terms of characterizing the the culture of an organization as a matrix. And along the rows of the matrix to have classes of processes. Those processes have names like standards, which is goal setting, uh, planning with a view towards strategic uh, execution, incentives, uh, information sharing. Those are classes of processes. And then along the rows to have a specific psychological pitfalls like um, hot hand fallacy, risk seeking in the domain of losses, overconfidence, and so on. And so a, a culture that is, is uh, strong doesn't have many entries in that matrix. It's a sparse matrix. I think that Psychological pitfalls reside. Think of them as gremlins. I, used to, I, I like to think of them as little negative elves. They live in processes. They're nourished in processes. Organizations that have weak culture feed gremlins. They allow psychological pitfalls to dominate decision making. And so, um, you know, a rough uh, measure is to I don't know, do the, the log of one plus the sum of, of uh, cells that are occupied, for example. That's sort of a rough cut numerical characterization of how you, how you talk about the strength of, uh, of a culture. And you want to have a, as low a score as, uh, as possible. A low score will, will correspond to a strong culture. So, so that's a sense in, in which I, I think about uh, uh, culture. And so let me just go ahead. I hope that's helpful. Um, yeah, so here's a really, really nice point from Felix uh, Kloman, who says, but will this knowledge of psychological biases help at all? Kahneman wrote last week, the confidence you will experience in your future judgments will not be diminished by what you just read on biases, even if you believe every word. So I want to make two statements. The first one is, I agree with what Kahneman wrote last week. That's statement one. Statement two, that doesn't mean you cannot debias. It just means you cannot debias by reading and then assuming that understanding will lead you not to be vulnerable to psychological pitfalls. So debiasing takes work. Debiasing takes training. And that training in organizations has to be group training. Uh, I'll, I'll just say that you know, I, when I teach risk management uh, over the course of a quarter or a semester, um, I, I devote many applied exercises to helping groups over the course of several months move from understanding what the biases are to changing their habits as groups. This needs to be done explicitly. So it's not just sort of opening up the head at the top and pouring knowledge in and then closing down and everything's going to be fine. That's the second point. The second point is there are things you can do, but it takes work and it takes effort. I love that question. Um, what? Okay, here's a question from Robert Garzotto. What, what about asymmetric compensation structures, almost unlimited upside and virtually no downside except being packaged out with a huge severance? Well, no question that um, 
uh, uh, let me so let me answer that question by putting it in the context of, of my 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 answer to the first question. One of the processes that you need to look at within an organization and the culture of that organization is is the reward structure. And if you have psychological pitfalls residing within the the incentive structure, you'll do something just like the, the embedded statement in this question. You won't design the incentives appropriately. So it takes effort to figure out exactly how to put together a, uh, a sensible incentive structure. This wouldn't be one of them. Uh, deep question coming up from uh, Abhik Goshal. Given that increased competition in the financial sector encourages or forces risk-taking behavior, can we realistically expect companies to have a prudent risk management culture in today's competitive marketplace? Well, this is a serious issue. So you could see it with Moody's and S&P, that competitive pressures force races to the bottom. There's no question we don't want to be naive about this. So really what you have to do uh, is you need to have a long-run strategy where you understand w exactly what your time horizon is, what the, uh, uh, what the risk profile is associated with the strategy. So this is something like, what do you do when you're in a, when you believe you're in a bubble? Do you ride the bubble or you, do you try and sit it out? Warren Buffett did not want to ride the, the dot-com bubble. He said it was a dot-com bubble and it didn't make sense. So during the dot-com bubble, before it burst, people looked at Warren Buffett and they said, that old man, he is old-fashioned. He doesn't understand technology. And so he looked like a has-been during that period. And he took the risk. Okay? He took the risk because he had a long time horizon and said, you know, when, when other people are, are, are bullish, you know, I'm bearish and vice versa. That was the strategy he followed. It's a long run strategy, but it comes at a cost that during the period of exuberance, you do underperform. And so it's a question of understanding within your planning process. This goes back to the culture itself within your planning process, exactly what the parameters are. And then, you know, not everybody has, has it, what's, what's, not, not everybody will choose the same solution. Every, we have different, different tolerances for what we do, but I think that, that the, you know, you, you do want to make an informed choice. So thank you for that question. Uh, let's see. All right. Stephen Scott. Some of these questions are long, so it's just taking me a bit, a bit of time to go through them. It would be interesting to hear how Hirsch reconciles the potential tension between managing the behavioral risks he discusses here with the call for the restorative tonic of animal spirits in the market, which is what Akerlof and Schiller wrote about. In other words, how do we manage risk with a view to capturing upside rather than just mitigating the downside? The, so from a behavioral perspective, we have a framework called behavioral portfolio theory. And it builds on the psychological structures uh, developed by uh, Lola Lopez, a uh, behavioral psychologist. She specifically identifies um, three elements that we call S, P, and A. S stands for security. P stands for potential, A stands for aspiration. And in a well-reasoned psychological setting, we pay attention to all three, not just to the downside, and not just to mitigating the downside because of behavioral bias. So the question is, how do we do that? Uh, in the behavioral portfolio theory framework, what we do is we are careful to identify each of these three particular components 
and then to structure the portfolio so that the downside gets addressed by one portion of the portfolio, potential gets addressed separately, and aspiration, the, by aspiration what I really mean is having a target that you really want to achieve where you kind of identify failure as performance below target, you have in place uh, systems that alter the, the uh, uh, profile in order to uh, minimize the risk of failure subject to being protected on, on the downside. So I can't give you a full answer to your question, but I would say that, for example, in the portfolio context, just to you know give you a sense, is that if you're protected on the downside, you can set for an individual investor, you can set aside play money. So you can use you know call options or or uh, synthesized lottery tickets to give you expansion to the upside. You can also become acquainted with enough behavioral finance to identify undervalued securities in the market and make bets on that. Although there are risks of doing that that are more than just fundamental risks, so I would you know, say do that with caution. Nevertheless, it is the case that it isn't just the downside you want to look to. You also do want to look on, on the upside. After all, opportunity cost, meaning gains you don't have because you were too cautious, um, our costs just as our as our um, unfavorable returns. So let's see what I think we have time maybe for one or two questions left. I'm just going down my list. So let's see. Okay, so how do you, this is from Tammy Salmon, how do you explain the behavior of regulators in the wake of all this activity and why they have failed to take action against culpable persons? So I think Tammy is um, a asking, you know, perhaps, why, why hasn't anybody gone to jail because of the excesses associated with the buildup to the financial crisis? And the answer might be that nobody actually did anything that was against the law. Anderson um, Consulting, in back in the Enron days, you know, folded because of a lawsuit um, by the Department of Justice. I'm not so, so certain that it was um, the merits were really there, but. We do know that Anderson in, was engaged in shredding documents, you know, so that when they after after they had been requested. So, I think that there, you know there are issues in in that respect. I think that uh, we know that uh, the the CEO um, and president of Enron both wound up um, being tried. I'm not certain that that anything that happened at Bear Stearns, for example, uh, or at UBS, or at Merrill Lynch actually qualified as illegal behavior and 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 so it 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 may be that just the evidence just wasn't there to 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 take action that was that you know as strong as as that all right we probably have time for one more question if my time is right so let me think a last question from oh gee I'm this might be from Tammy again, I don't know. What impact, if any, do you expect the Dodd-Frank to have on addressing the conduct that resulted in the financial crisis? Well, I think that in the short term, uh, the Dodd-Frank Act will, uh, will serve to provide us with stronger regulation than, than that would have occurred had it, had it not been present. However, in the long term, we have a tendency to be short in our memories. So the strong regulation of the 1930s and 1940, over time, Glass-Steagall did disappear. Over time, we did wind up with a regulatory framework that was a lot weaker. I think that weakening really started to occur during the, um, during, during the Reagan era. I think that the SNL crisis emerged as a crisis because of changes in the way that SNL industry was regulated during the 80s along, along with uh, an interest rate environment that wasn't particularly conducive. So in the short term, I think that you know, we, 
we still we're still in that crisis, and we will have stronger regulation because of Dodd Frank. But I think in the in the long term, uh, Hyman Minsky tells us we have short memories, as do behavioral psychologists. I think we will move away from that, and it's highly likely that we'll be experiencing severe crises in the future. But you know, life will go on, so I don't want to end on a completely negative note, just a realistic one. And then let me perhaps close things down here. I want to thank you for your great questions and your kind attention, and turn things back to Christine. Wonderful. We want to thank you, Hirsch, for that excellent presentation, and thanks to all who joined us today. The recording and presentation links for today's webinar will be sent to you in just a few hours. Thank you all for attending.